Good morning and welcome to Grace Church. As you're able, we invite you to stand with us and raise your voices to sing praises to our God and King. Oh, 
seated. Well, amen to that song. I've had uh, many people tell me how much they appreciate that song, obviously with the familiar tune and the great lyrics that go with that. And uh, it's appropriate, right? Right in between Christmas and New Year's. And as we're singing, the thought occurred to me, if you have a family gathering, wouldn't that be great to sing that uh, at, at midnight? So maybe go online, just uh, print out copies of the lyrics. Um, I think that'd be great. So, well, hope you uh, glad you're here. Hope you had a wonderful Christmas and moving into the new year. Uh, sort of a slow time here, so the main thing that's coming up is uh, equip uh, is uh, Monday the 4th, and that'll be sneaking up on us. Is there a main theme for that, Seth? Does it have a title to it? Discipleship. Discipleship. <laughs> Amen. That works. Always. Always. Okay, I'm going to throw a number up here. Uh, I've done this a couple times. See if you know. Oh, wait. I forgot to put the number up there. The number is, it's on, it's on, it's, it's in my pocket on a flash drive. Uh, the number is $1,600. $1,600. I won't wait long uh, for anybody who has a guess. That number is, uh, that's how much we're short on our annual budget by the end of the year here. And that is uh, a number that's better than has been for years. Uh, now, we, we always seem to, we always get close. We always seem to spend under our budget, so we end up, in the black, really, pretty much every year, praise the Lord. But um, that's closest uh, to our budget that we've been in years, even after all of the COVID stuff. So again, uh, praise the Lord. Thank you for your generosity. Uh, I looked at that. I forget to look at the, the number in the bulletin each week personally, but um, I saw that and I thought uh, I wanted to uh, thank the Lord and also thank you for your generosity. Any other announcements uh, to highlight before Rod comes? All right. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Well, there's no sunshine uh, to look at outside, so we have to bring our sunshine with us inside this morning. And as we come now to the, the clove of the year, where we are looking back to what was a most interesting year and looking forward to what is laying ahead of us. I, I think it's a good time for us as part, uh, all of us, as part of the Grace family to look again at just who the people of Grace are. You know, if it comes right down to it, <clears throat> if you've been here for a time, you know that the, the Grace crew is a, excuse the phrase, it's a motley crew. <laughs> There, we come from so many different backgrounds, coming from backgrounds of no church experience prior to uh, Lutheran and Methodist and Catholic and Baptist and Brethren and many more. If I've, if I've overlooked your bailiwick, forgive me. But, you know, when we have so many people coming from so many backgrounds, there are going to be a lot of different opinions, not, not on the central things of that, but I think one of the strengths that, that we have found at Grace is that we're willing to let people have preferences when it comes to things that are simply matters of preference, you know, and rather than fighting over things that are inconsequential, that are not the core of the gospel of Christ, and I appreciate that so much. Um, and as I was thinking about that, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with A.W. Tozer. He's a, a favorite author of mine. And he had something to say about that when it comes down as we're looking, you know, what the year has been and what we're looking in the, the coming year. What are we to do when it comes perpetuating the gospel of truth? And without getting stuck up on uh, things that are just preferences, and he writes this. When it comes to the matter of centering on the truth, uh, is it that it's my fate that I must center upon Baptist truth, or Presbyterian truth, or Anglican truth, or all of these, or none of these? 
Is it something far beyond that? Is it uh, that I believe in Calvinism or Arminianism? Is it we should have a congregational or an Episcopal, Episcopal form of church government? Must I interpret prophecy only as a premillennial or a postmillennial or going from one thing on to another? And you know, let's face it, we, when we take those terms, we all have preferences to where we stand on these things. And it has to come to the point where these things are away from the core and cusp of the gospel. They are things that surround it. And I think one of the strengths that we have is that we must center on that core of the gospel and not let the other things distract us and be willing to give grace to those who may view things differently. So Tozer says then, what is then the real truth? He says, maybe it's nothing more or less than this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I think he hit the nail on the head. Let's come together in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come together as a people of grace, a people called by your name. And we thank you, Father, that while there are preferences and different experiences coming together here, that we can look to you and know that the truth that we must center on, the truth that we must occupy ourselves with, is that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Father, thank you for each one who has come here this morning. Will you bless our time together? Help us to focus on you and to put other things aside for the time that we may, in the music and in the spoken word, be uplifted. Thank you, Father, that we can come to a new year and know that what's in the past is in the past and look to what you have for us in the future to hang tight and to follow the Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord, for your goodness to us in Jesus' name. I was recently reading through the book of Nehemiah. Sometimes that, some of those Old Testament books can seem a little obscure, but it's Nehemiah comes when the Israelites are coming out of exile back to the promised land, having the temple been rebuilt, the walls being raised up, and uh, Ezra, the priest, getting the priests all and the Levites all organized together. And they come to the middle of Nehemiah in chapters 8 and 9. And the priests in Ezra are reading the book of the law. They're just out there, and they were, they're spending, like, days, like, from the morning till like, later on. The people go home, they come back, and they read it. And they're explaining all these things of what's going on there. And the, the people, as they hear God's word, are incredibly humbled and broken and grieved by realizing how far they had gone away from uh, God. And, but in, even in that, that grief, <clears throat> the, the priests and stuff turn and go, they say uh, this from in Nehemiah uh, 9, 5, and we're going to be reading some uh, verses from Nehemiah this morning, and it's going to guide us through some of our songs. But in light of, of that grief and that, being humbled before God, uh, they're called to worship God. And they're called to actually find uh, joy in the Lord. Uh, but they say, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. So let us stand and bless the Lord as we're called to in worship. In the scripture, I should say. <laughs> Streams of above. 
is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The joy of you is our strength, Lord, because we do claim you alone, our God, from before time began. Lord. You are the one that holds truth. You are the one that has revealed truth to us, Lord. Thank you so much for that truth, for revealing yourself to us through your creation, through your word, and through Christ, Lord. As we encounter your truth, Counter who you are, Lord. We, may we just be humbled. May we be, yes, grieved by our sin, but may we turn, understanding that Christ has taken on that sin, and it's through his death and resurrection that we are redeemed and made new, Lord, and let us, let us take joy in that. Fill our hearts with your spirit and your joy, Lord, that we may proclaim 
your truth mightily to, to a world of darkness. Lord, as we come to the time of opening your word and hearing a message, Lord, uh, just refine us uh, by your word this time. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. As you blue. As you know, we are uh, delighted to always partner with, with Living Waters Bible Camp. Uh, we've got so many of the staff that uh, worship with us and uh, Talios, internship, summer staff, and we've had a, a wonderful partnership with them over many years now. And one of those benefits is uh, Living Waters gets some fantastic speakers in, and once in a while we get a little splash uh, of blessing uh, from that, and this morning is, is no exception, uh, guest speaker Carl Kirby. So I'm going to ask Dennis to come up and, and officially introduce Carl. Thanks, Rich. It's great to be here uh, and see familiar faces and to get to meet a few of you, uh, new ones that I haven't met. But uh, we bring Carl uh, in. One of our goals this year uh, at Winter Recharge is to help emphasize more apologetics. And Carl has been one of my favorite speakers on apologetics. He was an air flight controller in Chicago O'Hare. So if you ever wondered if you're safe, you used to be. Can't guarantee that anymore. But uh, I think because he was an air flight controller, and I was just thinking about that this morning, is that maybe that's why all those planes coming in at once, all that information that he had to go through his mind, when, he, when he's speaking this morning, he's going to be bringing information like hyperspeed coming into you this morning. And I think because it's all this information, and he by far is one of my favorite engaged uh, apologetic speakers. So we are greatly privileged to have him and to share him with you this morning. He's a, a husband of one, Masami, a sweet wife. I've only uh, seen her on their Facebook when they're talking together. And uh, appears to be a great cook from some of their Facebooks. And as, as a father of two, a grandfather of five, and as uh, great to introduce a co-worker in Christ, that is really his heart. Thanks, Carl, for being here today. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That was lame, man. Come on. <laughs> you can do better than that. I heard you sing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And I'm sorry, uh, Pastor Rich, uh, he gets some fantastic speakers in. Maybe you'll get one of those in the future. This time you got me. And I'm not a very good speaker, but I got really good pictures. And so uh, I'm going to show you all a lot of pictures today. This is actually one of my least favorite talks to give this morning. And I mean that with all sincerity because it's a tough topic. And tough topics sometimes aren't fun to deal with, but you know what? we got to deal with them. And so uh, I hope that I can do this uh, uh, justice. I hope that I can encourage you as well as challenge you because that's going to be my goal. I do want to extend an invitation. Uh, Mr. Dennis tells me that you guys, since you uh, are a partner church of theirs, are allowed to come out to some of the meetings that we're going to be holding this week. And that's what, the afternoon meetings at what time? Morning, Whenever? Check with Brent. You can come out to any one of them. So Brent, we just gave you a double job there, brother. Um, but feel free to come on out to any of them because we're going to cover a lot of topics. Uh, I think that you're going to see a lot of times people say apologetics and uh, guys' eyes kind of like roll in the back of their head and like, no, you know, it's going to be one of these things. And uh, I don't do that. Uh, I'm not smart enough to get deep. Uh, I grew up around guys with one name, crusher, bruiser, mauler, assassin. So uh, yeah, that's the truth. My dad was a professional wrestler, so trust me, IQ is not stressed in the home of a professional wrestler. <laughs> We're going to be doing rubber meets the road stuff, and that's, that's where I'm at. I truly, genuinely want to get a generation to know that they can trust God's Word from the very first verse all the way to the end, and then be able to go out into this culture and shine. Because, guys, let's be honest. You guys are probably a little protected up here, right? Smaller community. You don't have all the issues that uh, we see going on in the news with the protesting and all that craziness that's been going on, right? No, it's still here, dude. Trust me. <laughs> it might not be as visible, but that battle is still, still going on because there's light, there's light and there's darkness and there's going to be a constant battle. And the closer we get to the end, it's going to get even more apparent and we need to be able to shine even brighter. 
So that's my goal is to hopefully encourage a generation to shine. And so uh, that's why I'm going to address this topic that I'm addressing today. Because uh, I know, I'm telling you right now, this is not fun. I, I call this, whose voice are we listening to? And now, are, are some of you familiar with my little icon there? You know what I'm kind of alluding to? That TV show, The Voice, anybody? Anybody seen that TV show, The Voice? Come on, show me some hands here. Okay, about half of you. So I'm not in total trouble here. Yes, I watch TV. And uh, yes, I like The Voice. I think it's an interesting show. Now, I don't sing. Y'all were singing, and some of you may have been watching me. It's like, he's not singing. Oh, I don't sing. And there's a very important reason why I don't sing. Because I'm afraid this thing will go hot. And if you hear me singing, God says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I make a painful noise unto the Lord. I can't sing, okay? So I don't want you all to hear me and scare you out of here. But I do read the lyrics and I do internalize and think about it. It's like I'm typically so convicted because it's like, God, what I find is it's easier to sing those lyrics than to live those lyrics. And so I'm always reading and internalizing those things, but I just don't sing very often. As a matter of fact, there's only one time that I can really remember that I ever sang without caring that, any, that I couldn't sing. And I was in a really unique place, but I won't go there. That's a bunny trail, ADD. It's a gift. I'm telling you right now, teach them how to harness it, man. Don't drug it up. If you can learn how to harness it, I can do more in 30 minutes than most people can do in three weeks. But after 30 minutes, I'm done with it. I'm just telling you. So, uh, so whose voice are we listening to? Uh, it's a TV show. Some of you didn't see it, so I've got to give you a little background. I want you to imagine that it's a singing show, okay? Weird. A guy that can't sing likes singing shows. I do. I like good singing. And so uh, they, they have four judges, and they're, they're all, this is not, hello, a Christian program. You with me? You with me? It is not a Christian program. It's a secular program. So the four judges that they have are secular judges, but they're all very talented singers in their own right. And this season that I'm going to show a clip from, these were the four judges. And so what happens is, is at the very beginning, the judges have their back to the singers when they come out on stage to sing. And then they'll sing and the judge will turn around based on what they hear from the voice only to decide to try to get them on their team or not to coach them and train them to help them to become better singers and hopefully win the competition at the end. Um, so um, I like this for a couple reasons. Number one, we live in a world that is so superficial. You know, we make these judgments all the time that I like somebody because of the way that they look, you know, the, they got the right haircut, you got the right clothes on. And this is based strictly on talent. And I think God really looks at us that way as well. He looks at our talents. This outside stuff, don't get hung up on it, right? We live in a world, America, right? Most Christian nation on the planet, we spend a billion, that's a B, a billion dollars a year for plastic surgery. Why? Because we have been duped by the world to think that our value comes from something that is not what it really comes from. So be very careful. So here we go. The four judges, they sing. Now, you get your team and then they start competing against each other and they sing and then they choose and people have to vote. And so now let's imagine we're down to the final eight. I don't know how many you start off with this. I think it's 72, something like that. You're down to the final eight. Now imagine you get to that stage. You're really a good singer. I, you know, you get down to the final eight out of that many that have gone through, I don't know how many interviews and all that sort of auditions to get there. You're a really good singer. And what I've seen over the years from this show is that song choice is just as important as voice quality. Because you can have a great voice, but if you choose a bad song that doesn't really showcase that, you're voted out, you're gone. You don't get a second chance. So you with me here? We're down to the final eight. Knowing that you've got to get a secular audience to vote on you to get you into the final four. And a gentleman came out and he sang a very interesting song. And I'd like you to just kind of take a listen for just a clip of it. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame How I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world
think that it takes some guts to go out on this secular television program and sing the old rugged cross, knowing that you've got to get an audience that's not going to be Christian to vote for you, especially in this world today? Did it take some guts? Okay, this is not going to work this morning. Uh, questions require responses. I know y'all might be used to sitting here and look, like looking and not blink, but every 3.2 seconds. Forget about that today. Questions require responses. We're going to have some interaction here. Did it take some guts to do that? Yes. You bet it did. But this isn't the voice I'm talking about. I'm talking about a different voice. So let, let's jump into the word here because I want to take you to John 10. And it's starting start in verse 22. And I'm going, to, I'm going to go through this quickly for time, but uh, just skip over and bounce on some things. At the time of the Feast of the Dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Can I say to you this morning that I really don't believe anybody spoke more plainly than Jesus? I really don't. When you read the words of Jesus, yeah, he spoke in allegory and analogy, that sort of a thing. But Jesus spoke plainly. And I'm going to prove to you that he had already spoken plainly on this issue. If you were the Christ, tell us plainly. Listen to how Jesus responds here. I told you. Now, uh, Mr. Dennis told you that I was an air traffic controller in my professional career. I left it about 15 years ago. And, uh, uh, but when I left, my last job was as an air traffic controller at O'Hare. And at that time, it was the world's busiest airport, hence the speaking quickly thing, because uh, you better learn how to speak quickly when you're at O'Hare. And so uh, this is Chicago attitude right here. If you've ever spent any time around people from Chicago, they're like very blunt, all right? I'm being nice, all right? You ask a question, you get a blunt answer, all right? I'm not from there. I'm a country boy. So going into there was like, whoa, this is a different world. All right. I thought everybody's going to beat me up with a steam pipe or something. They sound like a bunch of mafia guys. And it's like, I see this coming from Jesus here. I told you. Now I'm not saying Jesus were from Chicago or anything, but I'm just saying, I see that. Look, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep are my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. By the way, by the way, can I please give you a promise today, a guarantee today that you can hang on to? It's not like a, uh, uh, a guarantee that the world gives to you. I'll never forget when I was still a controller, I was in Salt Lake City and I bought a new car back when I could, could afford to do that sort of a thing. And, and I bought the bumper to bumper warranty for that new car because I said, man, I'm going to drive this thing till it dies. So I bought the bumper to bumper warranty. It was not a week later that I got a flat tire on that car. So I took it back to the dealership and I said, hey, I'd like to get this tire refixed. He said, sure, that's, uh, I think it was like 70 bucks. I said, no, 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 uh, you don't understand. I bought the bumper to bumper warranty and the tire is in between the two bumpers. And he said, no, you don't understand. You didn't read the contract because the contract says very clearly we don't fix those kind of flats. Those are flats on the side wall. We only fix, fix flats on the bottom of the tire. You see, this is a guarantee that man will give you. They're always looking for loopholes to get out of it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you, you better read the fine print very closely in a man-given contract. But God-given contract, this is what he says. I give them eternal life. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. By the way, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Did you hear that? Make me feel like I'm a Baptist and give me an amen. amen. No one includes you. No one can take you out of his hands. You're in. You're in. That's a guarantee from the Lord Jesus Christ. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to stash them out of my father's hands. You think it's an important thing? He says it twice. I and the father are one. Hello? Is that plain? That's pretty plain, isn't it? Guys, I want to tell you, when Jesus tells us this, he had answered them. He had already told them, but it's not that they didn't hear. And I'm going to say the same thing to us today. It's not that we don't hear. It's that we don't like what we hear. How can you have America, the most Christian nation on the planet, over 400,000 churches, and Christianity to be as invisible as it is in the culture? It's because you many times have, a pew, have pews that are filled with people that may say Jesus with their lips, but don't know him. And they don't like what they hear from him, so they will give, them, give him a part of themselves. And God doesn't want a part of you. He wants all of you. 
He wants your heart. He wants your soul. He wants your mind. He wants your strength. He wants all of you. And many times we're not giving him all because of the voices that we hear. And I'm going to get there. You see, the challenge is when we don't like what we hear, there's a few, I don't know about you. Most of you, I don't know. Um, and so I can just speak from my experience. When I don't like something that somebody has to say to me, I've got these fallback things that I go back to, right? I've got these uh, attitudes and, and one of them is make an excuse. If there's something that you don't like about me, I guarantee you that I've got an excuse for why I do it. And if I don't have one, I'll make one up because I'm really good at it. Another thing, strike out in anger. Ever had that happen to you? Somebody tells you something and then, oh, you think you're better than me and you're this and you're holier than thou and attack the messenger because you don't like what you're hearing. It's one of my tools. Do nothing or maybe even hide. Those are some of the things that I have when people tell me things that I don't like. And he continues on. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and I follow them. I and the Father, what he had told them. And watch, I want you to think about this for a second. I want you to think about this. Jesus had told them and then he tells them again. So they asked him a question, right? Right? If you're the one, tell us, tell us plainly. He did. Did he speak plainly? What was the response? Thank you, Jesus. We have really been struggling with that one. We really wanted to know. We really appreciate you just being straightforward and honest with us, right? Is that what happened? Come on now, y'all read the word. You know what happened. They picked up stones. They're going to kill him. And Jesus says to them, for what good work are you going to kill me? And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to kill you for a good work. We're going to kill you because you being a man make yourself out to be God. So did he speak plainly? Yes. Did they understand? Yes. But they didn't like what they heard. And I'm going to say to you today that we have the same problem going on in our world today. They picked up stones to kill him because they didn't like what they heard. John 8, 58. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. They understood what he was claiming to be. Because you see, God, God did claim, or Jesus did claim to be God. Don't ever doubt that. Why don't we listen to that? Why do we have the problems of 50 to 88%? You know why this camp that you have here that you are partnering with is so important? Because in America, the most Christian nation on the planet, 50 to 88% of the younger generation raised in the church are gone by the time they're age 18. And discipleship is like non-existent in the vast majority of Christian churches that I've seen. Last year, I was on the road 236 days. This year, yeah, it's a lot less. COVID has changed a lot. But you know, it's crazy. We actually reached more people this year than we did last year because of the whole online thing. You know, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. You can start looking at all the negative negatives, but I was looking at all the positives. I don't know about you, but I know my community. I've been there for 15 years. In my community over the last eight months, I saw more family units walking together on the street than I had seen in the previous 15 years. There was a whole readjusting of, uh, of uh, priorities. You know what I mean to you? Me, primarily, 236 days on the road last year. Do you know what this experience has brought to me? I don't want to be on the road 236 days anymore. Because I saw what I was missing out on my relationship with my wife and my children and my grandchildren. I, I was so passionate about, I got to go. But then it was like, man, over the last few months, it's like, Carl, you need to temper this. You need to make sure that you got this relationship right as well. Look, I'm just confessing to you. I'm not, look, I'm a fellow pilgrim on the journey of life. I don't have it all wired. I'm just a brother in the Lord that's trying to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I also recognize this, that there is a point that you have to also keep in mind what your first priority is. And as a husband, that's your family. Yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, but then your family is a very close second ministry. Praise God we didn't have any issues, but I'm just telling you, there needs to be a little bit of reprioritizing going on in our lives, and I think this has been a good wake-up call to us. But many times we won't listen because of the voices that we're hearing. And so here's where it gets no fun. That other stuff is like, okay, yeah, 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 we can get it. But now, what are those voices that we're listening to? Let's identify them because, again, I'm too heavy to tap dance. If I tried tap dancing, I'm breaking an ankle. So I am just a straightforward, put it out there, and if I'm wrong, please show me where I'm wrong biblically. Biblically. 
Uh, as we heard earlier, uh, opinions, everybody's got opinions. And I don't really care about opinions. I care about what the Word of God says. And so if I'm wrong biblically, please show me. I will thank you. But here's the voices that I see that are impacting a generation. 50 to 88% of younger generation walking away from the Lord Jesus Christ by the time they're age 18. That's why this camp is so important. Because they are pouring into a generation. They are pouring into a generation that needs to know there's another way, that needs to become the light in this culture. Us older folks, sorry man. It's time that we pour in and let them run and pick the ball up and run with it because we have to do this. So here's the voices that I see. We're going to deal with some of these, and this is where it gets no fun. Internet, oh boy. Is this a voice that's having an impact on a generation? Uh, yes, I'll be blunt with you. It absolutely is. Let me take you to a secular source here to back my point up. Uh, New York Times, those ages 8 to 18 spend more than seven and a half hours a day on devices. Seven and a half hours a day on a device. Uh, by the way, uh, that doesn't take into account the half hour the text, uh, you spend texting or the half hour they talk on their cell phones. If you combine, all right, if you combine everything, we're talking 11 hours of media a day for this younger generation. Is this a voice? Yes. Is it having an impact? Yes. Uh, by the way, America, most Christian nation on the planet, the number two killer of teenage young ladies in America is... Questions require responses. Number two killer, teenage young ladies in America, the most Christian nation on the planet is? What's that? Suicide. suicide. Number one cause of suicide is? Anxiety and depression. Number one cause of anxiety and depression is? Stick with me. Dr. Carolyn Leaf. I don't know if she's a Christian or not. A secular author from what I've found. Teens are exposed to eight and a half hours on average of electronic media per day. According to the archives of general psychiatry, this increased simultaneous exposure to electronic media during the teenage years is associated with an increase in depression and anxiety. <coughs> you know what really strikes me? Is the number of young people, you go to a camp, and I speak at a lot of camps, quite frankly, and this year alone, probably five camps I spoke at. That was the most that I spoke at um, in all of my speaking. Typically it's churches, but this year a lot of the churches canceled, postponed, and all that sort of a thing. But the camps still opened up a lot of them. Praise God for that. But when you watch lunchtime, when you have the sleepover camps, and it comes time for medication. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now. I, and I'm not attacking anybody. I'm just telling you what I observe on a regular basis. A half of the kids lined up to get some sort of medication. What in the world is going on? Anxiety and depression is one of the major things that they're putting, giving the medication for. What's causing the anxiety, anxiety and depression? I'm going to suggest to you that many times we're putting the drug in their hand and we're paying for it. And not just physically, but spiritually. This is a drug. Carl, you got one. Yes, I do. I do. I absolutely have one. And I have two computers, two iPads. Uh, I got the, the technology thing. But guess what? My wife sees everything that comes on here. I make sure. She sees everything. She's got access to everything. Because it's like, you know what? I'm an idiot. And I know, but by the grace of God, there's not a one of us in this room that can't stumble and fall. So you better put things in place to protect you from your stupidness. And I am stupid. I'm not going to lie about it. This is having an impact. Let's keep reading here what she had to say. Norway, the Bergen Facebook addiction scale was developed in response to research showing that addiction to social media is proving to cause the same damage in the brain as addiction to alcohol and cocaine and is as addictive as drugs, alcohol, and chemical substance abuse. There's not a parent or a grandparent in this room that if they had a child or grandchild who was addicted to cocaine or alcohol that they would not have them in some sort of program to help them to get them off of it. We are paying for the drug and putting it into their hands. And then when we identify it, oh, but I, I can't take it away. It'll make them angry. Excuse me, parent. That's like job number one under responsibilities of parents. Make your children angry for the right reason. Guys, 
This is, look, this is not about me being a, 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 a negative attacking individual, but we have to identify the issue and then deal with it. You can't run and hide from it. And just being afraid, oh, I can't talk about it because it's going to make them angry. Hello? If you had a child that was addicted to cocaine or alcohol, I guarantee you you'd be dealing with it. This is just the same way. By the way, how much is too much? Interesting book. If you want to do some research on this, don't trust me. I know this lady uh, definitely doesn't claim to be Christian. She wrote this book. Just look for IGEN, I-G-E-N. It's like a really long, you know, <laughs> title. But her last name is Twinge, T-W-E-N-G-E. She's the uh, head of the uh, psychology department or psychiatry department at uh, San Diego State University. And she wrote this book, she did research, and very interesting. So how much is too much? At what point does the media start having an impact on this generation, okay? Uh, three hours of screen time a day increases the chance that a teen will be at risk for commuting, committing suicide. Three hours. What's the average that they're getting? 11. Now you say, that's impossible, Carl. They're not even awake 11 hours a day. Multitasking, Okay. They take into consideration multitasking. Like me right now, I'm multitasking. I'm walking and talking. That's my form of multitasking. Younger generation, they're driving, they're texting, they're watching a movie, and they got music going at the same time. Okay, so, so they got a whole lot more things going on than, than I can do. She continues on, and this, this is just stuff. I got to share this with you because it, it broke my heart when I started doing this research. She goes on and she says this, uh, rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed since 2011. Guess what exploded in 2011? Direct correlation. It's not an exaggeration to describe iGen as being on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades. Much of this deterioration can be traced to their phones. There is compelling evidence that the devices we placed in young people's hands are having profound effects on their lives and making them seriously unhappy. One of the ironies of iGen life is that despite spending far more time under the same roof as their parents, today's teens can hardly be said to be closer to their mothers and fathers than their predecessors were. Quote, I've seen my friends with their families and they don't talk to them, unquote, Athena told me. Ever experienced this? Ever walked into a restaurant possibly when you were still allowed to do that sort of a thing and see a family of four sitting at a table and all four of them have their face stuck at a device? And by the way, parent, it's not just the children that are doing this. And not a one of them talking to each other. They just say, okay, okay, whatever, while they're on their phones. They don't pay attention to their families, unquote. Like her peers, Athena is an expert at tuning out her parents so she can focus on her phone. Ever experienced this? Teens who spend more time than average on screen activities are more likely to be unhappy, and those who spend more time than average on non-screen activities are more likely to be happy. There's not a single exception. Guys, if you have a child that's suffering from anxiety and depression, yes, there are biological issues. Yes, yes, yes. I have family members that deal with that as well. But one of the first places you might want to look is how much time have they got this thing stuck in their face? If you were going to give advice for a happy adolescence based on this survey, it would be straightforward. Put down the phone, turn off the laptop, and do any, uh, something, anything that does not involve a screen. Can I encourage you that if you've got these issues going on, start there. I'll be honest with you. I've got five grandchildren. My children are older now, and uh, I'm actually kind of glad to be out of the parenting business because it's a whole lot harder now than when my children were young. Uh, but if I had children at this time... They would have a phone that was so dumb, it couldn't even text. I'm just telling you, because I want them to learn how to spell. And R has an A and an E in there somewhere, and U has a Y and an O, all right? So, and by the way, when you come in this house with that dumb phone, that, that's going in the basket out here. It is not going in your room. There's not a parent or grandparent in this room that would allow their child, their grandchild, to go into their bedroom, spend the night with the doors shut and locked with a stranger. Is there? guess what? Every time they walk in to that room with one of these devices, you don't have a clue who they're with. Man, I'm glad he's not my dad. Look, all I know is that it is my job to protect my child, my children, and Satan doesn't play fair. And he's using a device right now. He's using a voice to destroy a generation.
So here's some tools. Maybe this is something I, I've got. Like I said, my wife sees everything that I've got. Covenant eyes. That's a tool. I don't get a cut or a kickback or anything like that. So it's not like I'm making this recommendation. I got nothing to sell you. Covenant eyes. Maybe that's something to look at to help you if you've got these issues. Uh, circle is something that's very interesting as well. Uh, Disney actually makes this and they have Circle Go. It's a software that you put on all your phones and your one device, right? You can control when, how much, and if they get on uh, to the internet at all. And it controls all the other devices. It's a, it's a tool. It's a pot. Oh, there's workarounds. Okay, so we do nothing. This is a pretty po powerful tool that I've, that I've seen. And uh, Circle Go is for people that travel a lot. I mean, you can get on there and say, okay, yeah, you, get, you can have your uh, internet time today from 6.30 to 6.35 this morning. Boom. And uh, there you go. Hey, you got your five minutes. You set it up however you want, okay? Uh, here's another one. Uh, oh, that's, that's this one, more the Circle Go. Because Studio, I don't even know how to pronounce that, but maybe this is another option. This is a free option. There, my point to you is this. There are tools out there that can help you with this sort of a thing. But the answer is not to run and hide from this topic. You've got to talk about it. And, and by the way, this is a really interesting one. Uh, when your children want a smartphone, this is called uh, Gab Wireless. I love their commercial. I won't play it for you, but I love their commercial. Your, your kids get something that looks like a smartphone, but it doesn't text, it doesn't do anything but call. But it looks like a smartphone so they don't feel like they're goofs, right? Oh, all my friends have a smartphone and I'm gonna be a weirdo. Okay, you got something that looks like a smartphone, but it doesn't do all that other stuff. It just lets you call. Great commercial too. But it's, a, it's just a tool. I'm just saying that. But this is a voice that's having an impact. How about TV? Is that a, is that a voice that's having an impact on a generation? Ah, uh, interesting. The average time an American spends watching television, uh, watching TV, is five hours per day. By the way, average time a young person spends in a school system is 900 hours a year. That's the average time a young person spends in a school system. 900 hours a year. The average time they spend watching TV works out to be 1,064 hours a year. Are there any messages coming through the television? Oh, boy. By the way... I'm cutting this, condensing this down. What was the, we're getting to the end of 2020, so I'll update it at the end of this year. In 2019, what was the most watched television program in 2019? Game of Thrones. Now, in full disclosure, never saw an episode. I really didn't. Um, but what I found interesting is that they were wrapping it up, right? They were wrapping it up. They're doing the final episodes. And there was a big, it was on the news. People were freaking out. They were angry because they had a coffee cup, a coffee cup in one of the scenes. These are Vikings. They didn't have Starbucks back then. People were freaking out. I mean, they went as far. They went as far to spend millions of dollars to go back and edit out the coffee cup because people were so upset. And then to make matters worse, just a few episodes later, they left a water bottle in the scene. Vikings didn't have Purex or whatever these things are, man, a vino, right? They left... They left a water bottle in the scene and there's news and people are freaking out. I'm like... You know why I never watched a single episode of this program? Is because when it came out and it started getting popular, I just started doing some research on it. I, I, I kind of want to know. I'm dealing with a lot of people that are watching this stuff, so I want to know what's going on, but I don't necessarily want to expose myself to it because I did that and I got burned on some stuff. And I was like, man, you can't get that stuff out once you've seen it. You know what I'm talking about. So I don't want to do that. So I'm researching Game of Thrones and I went to the secular writers and this is what I read. This is a short clip, but I'm keeping it PG here. But this is what I read long before this water bottle, long before this coffee cup thing ever came out. It was the reason why I said, I'll never watch one of these. I'm not going to watch it. It said this, rape has become so pervasive in the drama that it is almost background noise, a routine and unshocking occurrence. Now think about this. We had news, headlines, front page, Game of Thrones, coffee cup, water bottles, people freaking out. But this... What's the big deal? It's just a TV show. Look, anything that normalizes such an action doesn't deserve any of our time. Doesn't deserve anything, any effort that we can give to it. 
We're going to freak out over a water bottle, but this is okay? Guys, we live in a world that is getting a lot of information, misinformation, jammed down their throat, normalizing stuff that's not normal. You know, I, I look at Scripture and it says in Matthew 6, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is, uh, eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. What you let in is going to work its way out. I mean, think of what Scripture tells you. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. When you're spending 11 hours a day with something, that is the company that you're keeping. And one last verse. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Look, I just got to tell you, what I read, that's wicked. I don't want it in there. But this is a personal decision that you got to make. How about video games? This is where I typically lose about 90% of the kids. Don't want to hear about this. It's just a game. It is not just a game. Let's be blunt here. Video games are absolutely tools that are being used to indoctrinate and educate a generation. Average time a young person spends in school was how many, how many hours? 900. How many hours watching TV? 1,064. How many hours playing video games? 936. It's a voice. And if you don't think there are messages inside of there, I'm sorry, but you better understand that there are. Think about this. Put it in perspective. The average time a young person racks up uh, is 10,000 hours of gaming by the age of 21, which is 24 hours less than they spend in classroom for all of middle and high school if they have perfect attendance. And by the way, any messages in the games? Let me give you just a couple of examples. By first uh, first uh, admission, though, I'm not a gamer. Well, I am a gamer. Uh, Tetris, flip, flip, drop. Um, <laughs> Mario Kart with my grandchildren. Yes, we play Mario Kart. I'm Wario. That's all there is to it. If I'm not Wario, I'm not playing. All right? So um, I do play games. I'm not going to... But here's the thing. I understand what's going on with them, and we have to be aware of it. But let's talk about some other games, like some of the big sellers. And, and these are a little bit older. My son is the guy that does all this. And, and I would like to update these examples that I'm giving to you right now, because he gave me some just this last week that I can't play. I can't show you because of how bad it is. Demonic stuff. I mean, crazy stuff on like top selling games. One of them is Assassin's Creed. It's a very popular series. I mean, it's sold a lot. Any messages in here? Uh, nah, there's no messages in this. Just one of them where you get to play, uh, you're the assassin and you get to go pull Jesus off the cross. Jesus didn't die on the cross. Come on. He didn't die on the cross. They're quoting scripture, the offering it. And yeah, Jesus didn't die on the cross. No, 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 no. I've actually got quotes from uh, history teachers, secular high school history teachers saying, your children should play Assassin's Creed because it teaches them history. Uh, yeah, wrong history. Here's another example, another one of the side adventures you can play. You can tell poor old Charles Darwin. Charlie D, man, that poor guy, those Christians are trying to kill him. Christians are chasing Charlie D all over town, trying to kill him. And, and, and uh, poor guy. So you got to protect him from those mean old Christians. And the newsboys... Not, not the band, the little boys, that, <laughs> little boys that sell newspapers. Yeah, the Christians are killing the newsboys because they're selling newspapers that have Charlie D stuff in there. That, that's, that's those Christians. But let me put it to you like this. Think about this. Why is this important? We live in a time where it's biblically illiterate. We have a generation that doesn't know God, doesn't know his word. The only God, the only Jesus, the only Bible that they see are right here. Video games, television. And how, is Christian, how are Christians and Christianity and the Bible depicted in these? Not good. And if this is all you know, of course you want nothing to do with Christianity. I don't want anything to do with guys that are killing children because they're selling newspapers that have an opinion different than mine. Me? I want to engage. Let's talk about this. This is what they're saying. This is what we're saying. This is what we actually see. Which one makes the most sense? You see, when you take Christianity as it was given to us, real history from a real God, and look at what he said and compare it to the world that we live in, psh, we don't have a problem. And the more we understand what they teach versus what God teaches, we got it hands down. 
By the way, this was interesting. This came out a little bit ago. Video game addiction is now officially a mental health disorder. The WHO is now accepting gaming disorder. My son came to me about five years ago now, and he said, Dad, I'm getting rid of cable TV. I got cable TV. I watched The Voice. I was like, why? He said, Dad, and I'll give this to you. Parent, grandparent, maybe this is something that you want to do. If you can get the young people to do it with you, with you, maybe try it. He said, Dad, I took a sheet of paper. I drew a line down the middle and a line at the top. On the left side, time spent glorifying God. On the right side, time spent in the world. He said, for one week, I tracked how much time I prayed, how much time I read scripture, how much time I witnessed, all of those things. And he said, man, I was so happy. I prayed for an hour one week. I read scripture for an hour and a half. I was so happy until I looked at the other side. And he said, I got a problem. So I'm getting rid of cable TV. My son was 33 years old at that time. Did I have to go to my 33-year-old son and say, son, you got a problem. You need to get rid of this thing. See, here's the thing that we have to do, parent. We have to pass on that faith. They have to own it. It can't be that they're sitting in church here today, as some of us might be, because mom and dad made us sit here. Or this is ritual. If they don't own it themselves, it's worthless. You don't get into heaven riding on anybody's coattails. You have to have that own personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they own it, they start checking themselves. Do this yourself. I did, and I tell you this right now. When I go into hotels... Television never comes on. Not because I was watching bad stuff, but I just looked at the hours and I was like, my goodness, how many hours I could be sitting here working on this versus this? Not going there. How about another voice? Here's another voice. Um, how about this one? Uh, news, right? Newspapers. There's a good one. Uh, we got some mature folks in here. You guys remember Dear Abby? Remember Dear Abby? Younger generation, like, who? Anyway, well, Dear Abby was like this lady. You had a, a question, a concern. You'd write her, and then she'd give you this advice in the newspaper. Well, I, I go to England uh, probably about every two, three years, and uh, they have a Dear Abby version in England. She's called Agony Aunt, all right? And I'm not going to fake the British accent. I can't do it. Uh, but she can feel your pain. Agony Aunt, all right? And so uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm over there, and I see this clip. And I have to share this with you because I want you to understand that what you believe about where you come from impacts the way that you live your life, genuinely, okay? What you believe about where you come from impacts the way that you live your life here and now. Take a watch. The question is, can a mother love their child so much that they choose to abort it? That's the question that was posed. Agony aunt, her response is? True, no, and I think that um, if I were a mother of a, a suffering child, I would be the first to want, I mean, a deeply suffering child, I would be the first to want to put a pillow well, over its face. Well, okay, hold up, hold up. The question is, if a, can a mother love their child so much that they choose to abort it? And the response is, well, if I have a deeply suffering child, pass the pillow. What? Where does that come from? Take a listen. Um, as as I would with a... Uh, you know, any suffering thing. And I think the difference is that my uh, uh, feeling of, of horror, suffering, is much greater than my feeling of uh, getting rid of a couple of cells. You see, what we have to understand is this, that if there is no God, what's wrong with her position? We are nothing more than a couple of cells. Given enough time, right circumstances, that's why we're here. There's nothing special about human life. But if there's a God who created you the way that he said that he did, guess what? He made you in his image and he loves you so much that while you were rejecting him, while you were spitting on him, while we, me, were driving the nails into his wrists and his feet, he comes as a man and dies on a cross so that we can have a relationship with him. That's how special, you want value? Think about this for a second. Your value has nothing to do with how pretty, how smart, how talented you are. Your value has everything to do with the fact that you're created in the image of God. You are fearfully, wonderfully made. You were literally knit together in your mother's womb and he loved you so much that he died for you while you were saying no thank you. That's value. Oh, by the way, I hope we don't have any good mothers in here by her definition. One last quote. I'm sorry, I was just about to introduce another guest there, but that was a, that's a pretty horrifying thing. 
would. to say that you would put a pillow over there. Of course I would. If it was child. a child I really loved who was in agony, I, I think any good mother would. I pray we don't have any good mothers here today by that definition. You know, I led a group through uh, Israel and at the Holocaust Museum on the, la on the day before we left, I, I saw this sign and it really struck me. A country is not just what it does, it is also what it puts up with, what it tolerates. And I'm going to say to you, the church, we've tolerated far too long a world teaching our children that their value comes from something other than the Lord Jesus Christ loving them and creating them the way that he said that he did. We have to take a stand. We have to deal with this issue. You see, there's all kind of voices that are having an impact, and we have to wake up. And if we're going to deal with this, we have to listen to the correct voice. And I know that you know where I'm going with this. It's the Word of God. But if we're not going to allow God's Word to be that authority and that standard for our lives, we're going to see what we see right now, because everybody's got their own opinion. And I say this again, with all due respect, it doesn't matter what any one of us thinks about a topic. It matters what God said on the topic. That has to be our standard. That has to be our authority. And if we're not willing to allow God's word to be that, we're done. I think the greatest gift, the greatest gift that we can give to a generation is confidence in the word of God, knowing that they can use it as an authority, as a standard to deal with issues. You know, I'll, I'll go to Luke here real quick, and I want you to think about this road to Emmaus, and I'm just going to breeze by this for time. I know I'm long-winded. I apologize. You've got these guys that had been in Jerusalem, and they're walking away, and Jesus comes up to them, and he starts talking to them. And it's like, what are you all talking about? And, and they're looking at him, and they got the Chicago attitude thing going again. What, are you new or something? Don't you know? Are you the only one that's not been around Jerusalem? He was the guy. He died. He's not the guy. He, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. What did Jesus do? To help them to understand. It's crazy what you're dealing with right now. I don't understand what I'm seeing on television. The churches are shutting doors. I can't go out. I can't eat here. I don't understand this. When everything gets crazy, you better have a point from which to start to get back in control. Watch what Jesus did. He gave us that point. He gave us that point from which to start. And notice what he does. And he said, uh, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? You don't know what's going on. These things come to pass in these days. And then Jesus... Starting in 24, I'm sorry, 25. He said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses. Think about this. And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. When things get crazy, you don't get it. It's not making sense. You better have a point from which to start to get back in control. Jesus took him back to the beginning. You want to understand why it's crazy right now? Let's go back to the beginning. What did God give us? He gave us what he wanted. It's not his fault that we see the craziness that we see today. It's our fault. We rejected. We said no thank you. He gave us what we asked for. Sin has destroyed this world. Not God. God gave us perfection. If you want to understand why we see what we see today, look in a mirror. And the more that man moves apart from God and says, God, no, thank you. We can take over from here. Hello. Look at our culture. We can in good conscience walk into a booth, make a mark, poke a hole, whatever it is that we do to put our leader in control of us and put a leader. I don't care about parties. And I can put a leader in control of me who has told me that they're going to take me further away from what God said when it comes to life when it comes to marriage, when it comes to all of these issues, and I can put them in control because I don't like. This is real world stuff, man. We're a small church. We can't turn this community, Jesus, or turn it around. Jesus Christ turned the world upside down with 12 people. If he can turn the world upside down with 12, there's more than 12 sitting in here today. You have the power because it's not you, it's him. It depends on the voice that you're going to listen to. Craig Wayne Boyd sang the old rugged cross. And after they sang, the judges will then give them feedback. And I found this next clip very interesting because think about this for a second. Secular audience. Pharrell Williams was one of the coaches that year. Pharrell Williams, by his own admission, is not a Christian. I'm not attacking him. He's a universalist. He was raised in the church. He rejected it. Okay. Pharrell Williams then said this to Craig Wayne Boyd. 
Uh, let's start with Pharrell. What'd you think? Man, Craig, I get it, man. To God be the glory. I just... Amen. Going through, going through everything that you've gone through to get, your, get yourself here at this place, I have a question for you. What does it feel like to be at the top of your game and to surrender it to God in front of the whole entire world and sing? Let me ask you a question. Is that a silver platter to preach the gospel? Hello? Would you like to hear how Craig Wayne Boyd responded? I'm wrapping up here. Would you like to hear? Yes. I'm not going to show you. <laughs> I won't. Because here's the point that I want to make to you. It doesn't matter how he responded. Here's what really matters. I'm not attacking you. Am I living my life in such a way that the lost would even think to ask me that question? Or have I gotten so good that I can go out into this world and I can blend in and I can do my Monday to Saturday and, and get back home and whew, made it through another day and nobody found out I'm a Christian? Yes. And then come in and play my Sunday thing and put on my game face. We can't do that anymore. I do want to show you one guy that did answer though. Benjamin Watson, football player. I don't know if he's playing anymore or not. I think he may have a, I, I don't keep up with stuff anymore. But he was on CNN. Remember when Ferguson was going on, all the rioting, the looting, and all that stuff was going on? Remember that? Ugly. Benjamin Watson was on CNN, and he was asked, point blank. How can we, you know, black, white, whatever, improve this? Well, I, I, honestly, I think I, I point to it in the very last paragraph that I read. And, and I'm encouraged because things aren't the way they used to be. You know, we all have grandparents that, that told us how things were. We've all seen documentaries. We are definitely making progress. But I think on an individual, on a, uh, on a micro level, the issue is not really skin. The issue is sin. And I, I firmly believe that the issue is that internally we are flawed. Internally, we need salvation from our sin. Internally, our sin makes us prideful. It makes us judgmental. It makes us prejudiced, which leads to racism. It makes us lash out at people that don't look like us. It makes us look past, look past evidence to protect people that look like us. It, it makes us do all those things. It makes us lash out in anger. It makes us point finger. It, 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 it wow. makes us, our sin that's in us makes us do those things. And the only, the only salvation for this sin is the gospel. The only way to really cure that was on the inside is understanding that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so th to me, on a micro level, it's understanding. It. Oh, and just like that, we lost him. I know, I heard you guys rapping me. I just couldn't let him go. Benjamin Watson, thank you so much. Good luck at the game Sunday. I'm Brooke Baldwin. See you Monday. Jim Shudo, up next. So you go out and you start talking to people. They cut you off. They mock you. They ridicule you. They reject you. They're not rejecting you. They're not mocking you. They're not ridiculing you. They're ridiculing the one that has sent you. And trust me, his shoulders are broad enough to take it. If he can go to the cross and die for us, somebody calling him a name, I think he's okay with it. We should be as well. But we're going to have to be bold. God says that you, 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 you claim Christ, you are the light of the world. And you're not here to be put up on a lampstand and put a cover over. We're supposed to shine. You know, I, I saw this question in Matthew 16 and it really struck me in 16. Uh, Matthew 16 says, who do people say the son of man is? Do you understand the implications of that question? That means we have to be engaged with the lost. We can't answer that question if we're not engaged with the lost. But then he asked this question and this is what I'll finish with. But who do you say that I am? Because that ultimately is where it's going to fall down. You can't get into heaven on anybody else's coattails. This is a personal decision that you, if you're sitting here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I have to challenge you. I have to love you enough to tell you that Christ loves you so much that he died for you because he wants to spend eternity with you. And how you answer that question, who do you say that he is, is going to determine where you spend all eternity. Pastor Rich, thank you for letting me be with you. I know I went long. Apologize. Uh, if you're going to the buffet, and I don't think they have them anymore, so you don't have to worry. The Methodists aren't going to beat you to the chicken. So <laughs> thank you for letting me be with you.
Thank you, Carl. That uh, I think everyone, you feel something? That's the Holy Spirit. And we have uh, in our discipleship huddles, we call these I will statements. So I would say, if I may, just uh, um, it's not enough to say, yeah, that applies to me. Uh, but you'll make an I will statement because of what I've heard, because of what the Holy Spirit is working in my heart and mind. I will make whatever changes are necessary. Um, so I'd like to close in prayer and also pray for the winter recharge. I think 57 or so students, uh, dorm leaders, other staff are going to be there as well. And we, we didn't get a commercial from Carl, but I'll make sure and provide all the links uh, for all of his resources uh, in this week's um, uh, church email. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit uh, who's doing the work in our hearts and minds. Uh, thank you that you put these words uh, into Carl's heart and mind to share them with us. And, uh, Lord, we, we don't want to make excuses. Uh, we, we, we all do it all the time. Uh, this would not be the day to say, yes, but, yes, however, I don't know if I can do that. And, and of course we can't. Uh, but bowing our knee, asking, begging help from you, asking help from one another, there's got to be people in our life that can come alongside of us and gently, lovingly, graciously hold us accountable to to an I will statement or whatever it is uh, that we do moving forward. Father, I also pray for uh, this next several days as uh, Carl is speaking at Living Waters uh, and the multiple messages uh, these young folks will hear, uh, the multiple uh, impact that your Holy Spirit can have. We pray it will just be multiplied uh, more and more there. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And all God's people said amen. Yes. Thank you.